Right. So again, thank you for um, letting me be here today to talk to you. And uh, my co-author Randall Powers is also on the on the uh, phone or Zoom, I guess I should call it. Okay. Gosh. How many? There we go. All right, I won't spend too much on this uh, outline, uh, but this is kind of the typical uh, flow, I guess, for some research. I'm going to give you some uh, background about the BLS, because the Bureau of Labor Statistics, because um, that's going to set some context uh, that you'll need uh, to maybe better understand uh, what we're trying to do. I'll talk about the motivation, uh, clustering approaches that we're using, uh, what's my workflow, what's the data set that we're looking at, and then some preliminary results. But I gave my husband a sort of a little practice of this today, and he said, well, it was good, but it was really confusing. <laughs> so, so I, and I thought, yeah, he's right, because it's it's kind of hard to to go through these, the the, the content because it's not very linear, you know, that it's kind of um, circular a little bit. So I said, well, I'm gonna talk about these like three pillars then. So here's my three pillars uh, for this talk. So there's kind of three main ideas. First is that there's a, a, a novel clustering approach that was developed by one of our colleagues. Uh, and I'll talk just briefly about that, but that's the clustering approach that we used in this analysis. The second uh, piece is an R Shiny app uh, that's been uh, developed by uh, Randall. And we're going to kind of use both of those um, tools to uh, start working on the creation of a classification system for uh, articles that are published uh, in the monthly labor review, which is a journal um, published by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So it's kind of these three things uh, that I'll talk about. And, you know, I'll, I'll be kind of circular. Like I said, it's not going to be real, uh, very linear. So we'll kind of jump around a little bit. But if at any time something's confusing and you're lost, uh, just chime in and let me know. So I want to say, uh, start off with uh, some background about um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, and I'm going to back up a little bit more on that. Uh, more, even more so, and talk about federal statistical agencies. There's 13 principal statistical agencies in the federal system. Uh, and you can see here, most of, they're all actually responsible for publish, you know, collecting data, publishing um, statistics uh, for uh, the public. And you can see that it encompasses you know, many different areas, uh, economics, um, demographics, transportation, agriculture, energy. I forget what her name, her name that she was, um, she introduced herself earlier. I think it was with, she's working for energy, but uh, she said, well, we don't do the policy, we're about collecting the data. And that's exactly what uh, the statistical agencies do. They don't do the policy, rather they collect the data, produce the statistics that are then used by the policy makers and the decision makers and the public. So in particular, uh, for the Bureau of Labor Statistics, our mission is to collect, analyze, and disseminate uh, economic information uh, for the public. Uh, as I said, we're an independent agency, as are all the statistical agencies. Um, we're not political, we don't do policy, we just, um, as I said, collect the data, publish the statistics uh, for others to use. None of my buttons are working here. So the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, sits in the uh, Department of Labor uh, and we are responsible for, I think, some pretty well-known uh, principal federal economic indicators. One of the main ones is the monthly employment numbers. Uh, and these are the one, this is the uh, employment report that publishes um, the unemployment rate, the number of jobs that are gained, that were gained or lost uh, in the month, the previous month. Another well-known one is the consumer price index. 
uh, which among other things is used uh, for inflation. We also uh, collect inf produce information about what does it cost to uh, have an employee? So what are the employee benefits? Uh, so wages, health insurance, vacation days, that sort of thing. We also have um, programs and surveys that look at uh, occupational injuries and illnesses uh, and, and productivity. So uh, the, the Bureau has four main offices. Really the, the three largest ones are the first three I have listed here. One is uh, prices and living conditions. The other one is compensation and working conditions. And then the third one is the employment, unemployment. And then we have kind of a small office uh, that looks at productivity. So here's the uh, a screenshot of the BLS website. And I know you probably can't see this too well, but uh, if you click on the, the home button and then I think this drops down and it kind of gives you a classification of of the website. So this is like how the developers of our website, this is how they've um, kind of classified the information that um, that's there and then how you can find it. Um, and so we want to sort of do something similar for uh, articles that are in this publication right here that you could see on the right which is the monthly labor review or the MLR. All right, so that's a little bit about uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Hopefully I haven't put all of you to sleep. Um, now, uh, a little bit about the, the goals of this research. Really the ultimate goal is that, you know, the three pillars that I showed you on that slide, the ultimate goal is to develop a classification system or a taxonomy for articles published in the monthly labor review. And whenever I think about a taxonomy or a classification system and try to develop one, I think of uh, clustering or unsupervised learning that you could sort of apply a data driven approach if you would uh, and you know do some clustering and use that as at least a start maybe for your taxonomy. Our colleague, Terrence Savitsky, uh, he's our resident Bayesian. He developed a, uh, an R package. Well, he developed um, a new approach to clustering. I'll say a little bit more about that later, uh, but he uh, included the, uh, that in a package that he wrote called Grow Clusters. So I'm going to kind of refer to grow clusters and this hierarchical clustering I'll talk about, and it's all kind of the same thing. But this is the package right here, grow clusters. You can't find it on CRAN uh, or GitHub or anything anywhere. It's not published yet. So um, Randall, my co-author and colleague, uh, he's been working on uh, learning more about data science uh, tools and machine learning and develop, you know, writing code in um, R Shiny. And so he used this as an opportunity to kind of, you know, expand his knowledge. And sometimes it's, it's easier if you're trying to learn something, if you have some objective or goal or, you know, that it's a lot easier to, to do it. So this was uh, such a goal for Randall. So what we wanted to do was to, um, implement some of the functions that are in this grow clusters package into an R shiny app. And so Randall's been working on that. Uh, and so I'm going to just show you a couple um, screenshots of, of the, uh, the app that he's developed and where it is at this point in time. It's not finished yet. Um, oh, and I figured since this was a talk at Our Ladies that I better have some R in here. <laughs> in my talk. <laughs> so I'm going to show you some screenshots and I'll just say this, the screenshots show uh, how the app is used with generated, this is for generated data. So if we're not at the, um, we're not at the end goal yet. This is just simulated data that you're going to see next. Uh, when you bring up the app, it comes up with this, um, 
kind of kind of opening or welcome page that has information about uh, the various uh, the tabs and the functionality uh, for the app. And you can um, load up data from um, a file. And once you load it up, you'll get this uh, table right here that shows you the, uh, you know, the data values. And I don't know how many uh, dimensions this is. Looks like what five. And over here is a like a text box, and you can enter how many uh, vary which variables do you want to uh, plot in a scatter plot that appears down here below the table. So if you have like something that's really high dimensional, you don't want to plot um, a whole bunch of dimensions here in this scatter plot. So you could uh, just kind of specify uh, a fewer dimensions to show. And at this point, we haven't, so with this data, at this point, you haven't done any kind of clustering in the app yet. Just, it's just a way to kind of look at it initially to see what the data look like. All right, next, uh, you go to the next tab and then you can uh, do the actual clustering there. Uh, one of the fields right here, I think it is, I don't want to peer too closely, uh, is the, yeah, the expected number of clusters. I think it's um, seven there if I remember right. And as I'll talk about a little bit later, this cluster approach, uh, that's executed by the app will, you don't have to actually specify the number of clusters, unlike k-means, where you have to say, what's the value for k? Here, we're just gonna kind of give it um, some reasonable number, I guess. But the, the method itself will estimate the number of uh, clusters or groups uh, in the data. So here, even though we had seven right there as an expected number, I think it found eight if, my visualization is right. Okay. We didn't ask initially, uh, but Wendy, do you want questions now or? As oh, yeah, go, no, yeah, go ahead. You can ask as we go. Yeah. Okay. There's one question from Alyssa in the chat. Uh, what do clusters mean or correspond to in this application? Oh, I'm sorry. Could you say it again? What do clusters mean or correspond to? Um, well, in, in this, this one right here, uh, the one that I'm showing right here is, there's really no meaning behind it. In other words, it's all just simulated data. But later on, um, what we'll be clustering will be the the articles, the document, the articles that are in the monthly labor review. But in general, the clusters or the groups, the idea is that you want observations in one group to be similar to each other, yet different from observations in other groups. So you're sort of clustering them based on, you want to find kind of like some topics, right? Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, that's eventually what we want to do. But this, what I'm showing right here is just simulated. Uh, so the purpose of these slides are just to kind of introduce the app. Yeah, so good question. <laughs> now, that's really important because otherwise that's a really uh kind of one spot where you could uh, sort of get lost so thank you for asking that um once we cluster so here in this one we've we've clustered it and then it's always good to visualize when this is where you know we kind of need your expertise but um so for right now we've just got a scatter plot matrix and the colors are the correspond to the cluster ids Okay, so there should be, I guess, eight different colors there. And a scatter plot matrix shows all pairwise scatter plots. So here we have, what, five dimensions. And so this, I, you can see my cursor moving, right? I hope. Yes, yeah, I can see it. Okay, cool. I never, I'm never sure what's actually shared or shows. Good, okay, so in this scatter plot right here, the vertical axis is the uh, V1, the first dimension, and the horizontal axis is V2. Okay, so you have all pairwise scatter plots, so it kind of shows you uh, pairwise relationships. Uh, and so what you're just kind of looking for here is, does it seem, you know, 
color wise, looking at the colors, do the, do the groups uh, kind of make sense? And <clears throat> so the other way you might visualize higher dimensional data is with a parallel coordinate plot. And I have to tell you that between this, the colors in here in the scatter plot matrix and the colors here don't match. All right, so that's one thing we could improve, right? Is whatever color goes with cluster one here, say it's blue, that should also be cluster one in this one. So hopefully so, that makes sense. I mean, you you asked for my feedback a little bit. I'm, I'm just gonna say that um, one of the things you could do is consider a, a different color scheme. Um, so I don't know how many cluster, what's the maximum number of clusters you could have? So that's another question because the color scheme depends on the max, the number of clusters you could have. Um, so, you know, and, and that's something, you know, you might want to want to think about. So my, yes. my favorite color scheme is, um, is yellow, green, blue, um, or, or viridis, I think is what it's called. And that's, um, that's good for colorblind people, but, but, um, it depends on what it depends on is the maximum number of clusters. So, um, yeah, I was yeah. gonna say one challenge is if you have a lot of colors, I mean, even if you're not colorblind, if you have a lot of colors, it becomes really hard to tell them apart. Um, there are also, I think, these approaches of linking plots. Um, and I know like you can also, if you want to have like an interactive component, uh, Plotly, which I think was developed for JavaScript initially, but there's an option of doing Plotly in R, which you can overlay on top of like ggplot. So there's multiple interactive things in, in R that you could do with plots. I found that the Plotly addition to ggplot is sort of the easiest one because there's also ggviz, but I think ggviz is kind of limited in terms of what it can do. So in case you want to like pick out one of those lines. Um... Yeah, I did. Yeah, we did. Oh yeah, go ahead, Randall. Uh, yeah, we did, we subsequently uh, did that. I think Wendy's going to show that in a later oh. slide that we, we uh, have it so that we can isolate one line now and gray out all the others. Yeah, because it kind of depends. Like, you don't want to just have like kind of interactivity for its own sake, but it's really good for like looking for outliers or, you know, it kind of depends what your goal is. Yeah, and I love your suggestion of linking too. Um, because, like I said, that we don't have the colors aren't, you know, we can't link it by because the way, the way we've got it right now is the colors don't link together. Uh, but it would be, it'd be kind of cool to be able to brush and link, do brushing and linking. There's, um, so sorry, that's my dog. If you hear her scratching in the background. <laughs> but anyway, um, another thing you could consider doing, um, Randall, is you could consider to putting two plots on the same, on the same, um, like page, tab, yeah. on the same tab. Um, you might want to consider doing like the scatter plot and the parallel plot on the same tab. Um, another, you know, I have a, another idea, which is, I think might be really challenging. It's something I haven't managed to do yet in, in shiny, but is to be able to change the orders of the variables, because when you're looking at a parallel plot, it, it matters what, you know, which variables are next to each other. So that might be something you want to look into. Um, I think that would be, you know, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't managed to, to, Anyway, because I, I also have a parallel coordinate plot in my um, Shiny application, but I, I didn't actually try to, <laughs> to move the variables, but it would be neat to be able to order them so that it's not just one through four, five, but you could also do, you know, two, one, four, you know, whatever different orders. I yeah, know. I actually did that in uh, MATLAB where I had a, I, I guess I called it like a permutation tour where it would like just permute the axes in the parallel coordinate plot because you're right it does show pairwise relationships and one of the things with clustering is as you would go through a permutation tour what you would want to see would be that the the bundles kind of stay together so each one of these lines is an observation uh and so what you'd want to do is just to see as it permutes, like 
these blue guys, do they all kind of still stay together or, uh, or what? So, um, yeah, but you know, Gwen, when you gave that talk at BLS, you kind of had something where it was animated. Um, well, I would, you know, I, yeah, I, I did. I had, I had an animation. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you, you want to, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what you're what, what you remember. Yeah. Well, I'm just going to make a note. Maybe you and I can kind of connect. Oh, that's a good idea. And Randall, I just wanted to mention, there's a book called JavaScript for R that you might really want to look into that is about extending shiny and like building your own widgets, which I think, okay. um, which I think his name is C O E N E. Um, and he, I think it's like, I don't remember the first name, but anyway, if you look up or it's, or R for Java, JavaScript for R, I think is the name of the book, but, um, anyway. Okay. Um, thank you. You're welcome. All right, this is exactly what we we're hoping for. Um, okay, so that is the uh, Shiny app and we'll see similar screenshots when we start uh, clustering the articles from the monthly labor review. Um, all right, so this is where you can see where I'm peering closely here. <laughs> you can see my forehead. <laughs> um, well, or I'll just let you guys look at it, but anyway. The Monthly Labor Review is um, a journal from, published by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And, uh, and it really focuses a lot on, of course, labor statistics, but uh, the programs and the data and so forth that, that we publish. And I can't read it because it's too small, but here, this uh, last sentence, it says subjects include labor force, et cetera, et cetera. So in the um, so this is kind of what we're trying to get at is what uh, what might be some of those subjects or topics uh, that we could use to kind of classify uh, articles in the monthly labor review. So this this actually turned out to this was a project that um, Sam uh, was she did work on this project uh, when she was here at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. She was a AAAS uh, fellow and it was, I think it was the fall of 2019 and then into 2020. Uh, and she, she did work on this, she did topic modeling for it. Uh, and, but it was towards the end of her tenure and we just didn't have a chance to uh, work on it. Part of that was my fault because I was busy with other stuff. Um, so I, you know, I said, well, I'll just kind of take it up when when she's, uh, you know, later on. So now Randall and I are working on working on this. But we have an office of publications, uh, and they're responsible for the monthly labor review and other stuff. And what they wanted to do was to assign, you know, to create a classification system for the articles so that they could you know assign subject labels for the articles like if you wanted to look for something on uh employment you know you could find those articles and so on um and but the thing is is that what you know what labels or topics or whatever do we use how do we do that the some of my colleagues had for about two years now, I think, they had developed a taxonomy for the entire BLS website, you know, kind of like that page that I showed you at the beginning. Um, and so do we use something like that? Uh, do we use like just the major program titles offices that I've talked about or the survey programs, uh, keywords maybe that authors uh, might have used? I don't remember seeing it, much of those with the articles. But uh, I saw this as um, a clustering a problem or unsupervised learning because I thought, well, why don't we just do some grouping, do some clustering and um, see what types of topics or themes can we find? All right, so that's my, that's our kind of ultimate goal is to sort of work towards this taxonomy. 
So somebody asked earlier about, you know, kind of like, well, what do you, what are we doing? Uh, we're trying to do, as I said, uh, unsupervised learning or clustering um, with these articles from the monthly labor review. And with unsupervised learning, the assumption is, or the reality is that you don't have any existing class labels for each of your observations. Each of my, observa my observations in this case are, an observation is an article published in the monthly labor review. And so what we wanna do is try to group, in this case, documents or articles together such that articles that are in the, the group have similar meaning uh, or topic and be yet also different than documents, articles that are in another group. So um, clustering or unsupervised learning is a tool uh, used in exploratory data analysis. And whenever you're doing exploratory data analysis, you should always try different things. So different, uh, in this case, different clustering approaches, maybe different ways to measure uh, distance or similarity between objects, uh, different ways to reduce the dimensionality. And uh, try these different things, look at the results, see what, see what you could find, what's similar, what's different, uh, what type of structure can you find, uh, and so on. So as I said earlier, we, the clustering approach that we've used so far is the one developed uh, by our colleague, Terrence, uh, and it is inspired by Bayesian hierarchical models. So I'm not gonna go uh, into this in any great detail because quite frankly, I don't understand the details. Um, but I'll just point out this, that it does, I said determines the number of clusters, maybe that's a bit strong. It estimates the number of clusters. Okay, you don't have to specify it ahead of time. And you could kind of think of it as a, like a hierarchical version of k-means where we don't have to specify the K. And it's not hierarchical from the standpoint that agglomerative hierarchical clustering is. Okay, so it's not that way. It's just hierarchical because of this sort of Bayesian uh, flavor to it. Now the, the approach that Terrence created, developed, it has both what I call a single source type of clustering, and I'll talk about what that means shortly, and then this hierarchical version. So to explain the difference between those, it's I think easiest to do it in the context of our application, which is to cluster the articles in the monthly labor review. So if I was gonna look at it as say a single source of documents, I would say, all right, I'm gonna take articles from the monthly labor review spanning several years, okay? It turns out we have 14 years of articles from the monthly labor review. I could take those 14 years of, doc of articles, think of them as being published all at the same time and you know, neglecting the fact that they happened over a period of 14 years. So it's just one set of articles. The other thing I could do is take each of those years of articles of the monthly labor review and I could cluster them separately, right? I could consider each one as a corpus or a set of documents. And in, in which case I would be kind of thinking of the articles as being completely independent from each other, right? That each year, you know, the topics discussed in one year don't depend on the topics discussed in the next year. Um, and I would say this first one here, the single source, kind of, we can kind of think of the, the articles as being sort of completely dependent on each other because they're all just one uh, corpus. This hierarchical version uh, or clustering, Bayesian clustering that Terrence developed kind of takes a middle view. It, it does sort of these local clustering, uh, the local meaning clustering for each year. 
uh, but then it kind of links it to global clusters uh, that are found. And if you can think about it, this is really kind of what we want to do because we want to find global, we want to find global topics, right? For, for all of our monthly labor review articles. But keeping in mind, we know that they're also published annually, all right? So uh, this hierarchical clustering takes into account um, the fact that we've got global clusters, we're looking for global clusters, but yet there's still this local structure that we might want to account for. All right. Um, I've kind of mentioned a lot about the monthly labor review. I'll just say this, that uh, started in 1915, it's a long time ago. Um, and uh, as I said, it is a journal of the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So one of the things is that the monthly labor review has what I call um, a restricted or a kind of a constrained domain of discourse. In other words, it's all about labor statistics, okay? You're not gonna have like astrophysics in there or um, try to think of something crazy, <laughs> you know, that wouldn't be in there. So it's, it's not like, trying to uh, cluster articles from a, a newspaper or something, right? These are all articles about labor statistics. The other thing to keep in mind is the articles, uh, well, they're, they're available in both HTML or PDF. I used uh, all PDFs. Uh, they, they had different kinds of formats and structures. They had charts, they had uh, graphs, I mean, um, figures, tables, summary abstracts, uh, some had footnotes, references, and so on, uh, links to uh, websites and BLS programs. I didn't try to account for any of that in my data cleaning. I simply extracted the text from the PDF documents, and I'll talk about a little bit of the data cleaning that I did. Uh, but I didn't worry about this, this other kind of structure in the article. So it was a bit noisy. Here's just a, a link to the monthly labor review. We'll talk more about that. So here's my workflow. I have a quick question about it, if that's okay. Sure. So um, are the articles, are there ever like special issues or are there ever articles that are commissioned or invited so that sometimes there's like a special issue around some topic, right? So you kind of know they're all kind of in the same topic or maybe like around the time the census comes out or whatever, like whatever, you know, specific events, like years or times of the year, there's like some specific topics that tend to pop up. That is a really, really good question. I don't know that they had special issues necessarily, but that's something we should check on. Randall, hopefully you're taking notes. <laughs> yeah, or, or just, you know, or maybe, you know, like kind of like if you have the clusters to see like, is there like seasonality or are there, you know, like are there specific things like? Yes, actually there's one that I know of that comes out, I forget what time of the year, but we do uh, something called employment projections and it's usually out 10 years. And so they, they project like what are going to be the hot jobs in 10 years, 10 years from now. And uh, that was always pretty much published at some certain time of the year, an article about that. Um, yeah, so that's a, that's a really good point that there might be kind of repeating, repeating articles. Now, I don't know that there actually, Oh, you know, there was a special issue once on um, like the history of the consumer expenditure survey, I think it was. So we should, uh, we should definitely check on that. Very good point. Um, okay, so uh, what I, you know, so I've got, once you got the text, of course, you have to, uh, convert it to numbers so that I mean, we need to be able to do some processing on and computing with it. So we didn't do anything fancy here. Uh, we just used the, the term document matrix. 
oh, and by the way, I'm going to talk about the these steps in a little more detail uh, shortly. So this just kind of give you an overview. Uh, so I used uh, the term document matrix. We didn't do any stemming or anything like that. Uh, then I like to kind of look at what I call like a descriptive statistic for the for the corpus, and that, that's just kind of looking at a, a word frequency distribution to kind of get a sense of what's there. We had a question on. We had a question from Monica on why 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 don't you do stemming? Oh, well. Mostly because it's kind of preliminary right here, uh, but sometimes I, I found that stemming doesn't really help. Um, although, remember I said at the beginning that um, this is kind of exploratory. So she's right. What you could do is, uh, so here I'm kind of trying different things. My different things right here for the talk today is whether we use raw frequencies or binary, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But you could also do no stemming and then stemming and then see what you get too. So no, that's that's a, a good, a very good point. Uh, mo I didn't do stemming mostly because it's preliminary, but uh, it's definitely something else to, to try. Um, and I use uh, isomap, I'll mention that a little bit too, uh, but you could try something else right here. Uh, I've done that too, I've tried, I mean, in other applications, you know, I've, I've varied these different um, steps to then see what I get. Uh, I'm only applying one clustering approach here. Well, maybe two if we think about it, but uh, I like to try, different um, clustering methods. So, you know, maybe k-means, agglomerative clustering, model-based clustering, because the clustering approach drives what type of clusters you get. So, for example, k-means, it looks for spherical clusters. So that's what you're going to get, spherical clusters, uh, for, you know, for the most part. So the results really depend quite a bit on the clustering method used. And then of course, you know, you're going to get clusters, you'll get a result, but you should always look to see, did the results make sense? All right, so those are just my kind of general steps. Um, for the articles, we had 574 articles. So it's 574 observations over 14 years. So starting from 2000 up to 2013. And, um, the highest uh, number of articles in a year was 57 here, and then the lowest was 10. I don't remember what happened in 2013, why it was only 10, but, um, so this is, you can think of this as my little N, 574. Now, across these um, 574 documents, there's over 12,000 unique words. Um, and so in, sort of the terminology for a statistician, I would say my N, my little N is 574. My P, my number of dimensions is over 12,000. So I'm in this like really high dimensional space. So this is a small N, large P situation. All right, uh, just a little bit about how, what I mean about the, the encoding as I said, we just used a very common approach, the term document matrix, I call it, or the bag of words. It's just kind of looking at uh, like a frequency histogram, uh, a word frequency histogram for each document. But in this term document matrix, each row corresponds to a word. So we would have 12,400 and something rows. 574 columns, each column is a document. And then the IJ entry in the matrix would be the number of times that the ith word appears in the jth document. And that would be the raw frequency encoding. So the number of times the word appears in the document. Um, the other one uh, was binary. And in this case, we have, 
there's a one there if a word appears in the document. It doesn't matter how many times, it's just a one. So it's either there or it's not there. And I really like the binary encoding when we have a case like we have with the MLR, where it's this kind of constrained domain of discourse. It's all about labor statistics. Okay. And of course, there's other there's other kinds of uh, term weights or encodings you could do. It's still yet in this term document matrix framework. Uh, so those are other things that you might try to. So I also like um, MATLAB and MATLAB has a text analysis toolbox. It's really uh, very good at loading up text documents and it's very, very good at getting uh, text out of PDFs. Uh, it's pretty accurate and uh, so I, I use that. So for most of the work Today, I've, except for the actual clustering part, uh, I used MATLAB. So I kind of went back and forth, like MATLAB to R. Anyway, uh, so now I've got you know everything kind of input. But uh, I guess actually maybe before I even got to this part encoding the text, uh, I had to do all this mess right here. Uh, I had to remove what I call what are called stop words. These are non-informative words. I just used a generic list, nothing special. I removed short words, long words, and infrequent words. Uh, one of the things I noticed. Oh, I also removed all special characters and um, converted to lowercase. And so one of the things I noticed is that when I re removed the um, special characters there were like urls in there in the text and so then they kind of got all smushed together as one strange word so this type of processing right here got rid of some of that and acronyms maybe it handled also misspellings and that type of thing the other thing i did was remove what i call domain stop words so these are words that not that where normally we would not think that they were, it's too many negatives, not informative. <laughs> I mean, we might think that they would be informative, right? But, you know, in a certain uh, set of documents, they become not informative. So for example, with these data, I took out the words monthly labor review. <laughs> because, yeah, I mean, I know that's what the articles were, so, um, I got rid of those and so some other things. Another example of this is I did a similar um, analysis of uh, work papers that were published for a series of workshops all on data editing and imputation. And when I did a like a frequency distribution, so what were the most common words in the across the set of workshop papers? Well, the top three words were data, editing, imputation. So uh, those are the kind of words that, you know, they, for depending on the application and the, the data, the, the set of documents, you might want to get rid of them because they don't really add any uh, information. So I got rid of some of those things. Uh, I used to hate word clouds, but now I kind of like them. Uh, so hopefully you don't hate them because you're going to see a lot of them. Um, so I, I like to just kind of look at uh, across all the documents, the word frequency distribution. So this is single words. And I don't think this is very, very informative with respect to maybe potential topics. Uh, so instead, what I like to look at are um, word pairs. So this is word clouds. Instead of frequent single words, it's uh, word pairs. So you can already see here that it sort of tracks, if you would, uh, the subjects, you know, those four kind of main programs that I talked about. I think retail trade has to do with productivity, but I have to check on that. But you see here about healthcare, health insurance, that's employee benefits, 
uh, employment. Remember, we had the uh, employment, unemployment numbers, uh, wages, and so on. So, looks like there might be something there. All right now, I have a little bit of a sense of you know my corpus. Um, I have now a uh, term document matrix and. If you remember, I have 574 observations over 12,000 dimensions. I could cluster them in this high dimensional space, but I found that the dimensionality is just way too high. So uh, I reduce it and I use something called isomap, which is isometric feature mapping. Um, I'm going to, I can give, um, Gwen, I can give you the slides. I don't know if you post them anywhere, if you can post them. But there's a link here to um, isomap. And essentially what it is, is it's a form of, uh, it's a nonlinear dimensionality reduction approach. It's, a, it's actually classical multidimensional scaling, but the inputs to classical multidimensional scaling are estimates of the geodesic distance between observations. Uh, and so if you go to this isomap link, there's a really good graphic explaining it. But uh, as inputs to isomap, you have to have all the inner point distances. Uh, and you could use Euclidean distance. Um, I think, I don't know, there's a whole bunch of distances you could use. And I used um, the Jacquard distance in MATLAB, which is essentially one minus the Jacquard similarity. Uh, this is another thing that you could play with. In other words, you could use different dimensionality reduction approaches and then see what you get. Uh, you could use different distances and see what you get. In fact, that's what I did. I used isomap, but then I tried different um, distances and ended up uh, Jacquard seemed to be the, the most promising. And essentially what you have to do is you have to say, all right, well, I'm in this 12,000 dimensional space. How many dimensions can I reduce it to? Uh, that's another thing to, you know, kind of play with. And what you get out of isomap is something similar to a scree plot that you have in uh, principal component analysis. And so I kind of look for like an elbow in the curve. And so with the, with the, um, raw data, so this is where we had the term document matrix with the word frequency, how often does it occur? Uh, I reduced it to three dimensions. For the binary case, uh, I reduced it to four dimensions. So in the framework of a data matrix, we have 574 rows and three variables for the raw encoding. For the binary encoding, it was 574 rows and four columns. So a significant reduction in dimensionality. All right, in the Shiny app that Randall developed, we only have this single source clustering implemented. We don't have the high, hierarchical one. So with the app, I'm only going to be showing you the case where we have all of these articles published at the same time what um, topics or themes or classes can we find? All right, so this is the raw encoding. And um, I think if I read right, there's, I don't know how many is expected number, oh, seven there. Uh, but we find eight. And this is kind of typical with, uh, with text where, where you've got this really high dimensional data and you've reduced the dimensionality that sometimes you end up with these really large clusters and then a bunch of smaller ones. Although we still see there's three of them here that uh, are sort of medium, medium height. So the height of the bars is how many documents are in that cluster or group. So we have a, uh, the scatter plot matrix. And the idea here is we'd like to, the, and the colors correspond to the clusters found. Um, and it doesn't look too bad, but I don't know if you could see, um, yeah, I don't really like when this color scheme because the yellow is really hard to see uh, in it, but 
color wise, the separation, I mean, it, the groups uh, seem reasonable. But I don't know if you can see, but there's this sort of weird structure here where it almost looks like a comet. First one that looked like this one looks more like a comet. And often what you'll see is like the observations will be sort of grouped in this little point right here. And then things sort of flare out like a, like a crab or a squid, I don't know <laughs> what it looks like. Um, and that's kind of reflected here, the fact that you end up with these sort of um, larger groups, and then these would be like the little groups out in the tails. Uh, and that often happens when I have this like raw, the text where it's the raw frequencies. Uh, here's the Scott of the parallel coordinate plot. Um, it, as you know, Gwen pointed out earlier, there's a lot of over plotting, so it's, it's kind of hard to see what's going on. But uh, some of it, it looks maybe somewhat reasonable, like this um, purpley line here, group of stuff, observ I mean, lines. But this is what Randall was talking about. Uh, he added this option where I think if you um, click on something over here, the the cluster ID, it'll just highlight that one and then the rest are grayed out. Gwen, is that kind of what you were talking about? Um, I think that was Samina, but Oh, okay. yeah, I was, I was mentioning yeah to, to try to to try to highlight them. I guess another thing is because here, are you trying to plot every publication? Mm -hmm. Publication is the line. Yes, and thank you so much for asking that because I meant to say that here. Each dot right here is a document. Each dot yeah, is I mean, a that, yeah. yeah, and uh, and then this is the these are the three isomap dimensions. So. Uh, these axes have no semantic meaning anymore, really. Right, right. Because I was gonna say, like, sometimes, especially for the plots, if there's a lot of overplotting, sometimes what could help is if you just do like a random sample. Mm. I don't have like that many of them, but you could consider having an option, you know, like randomly sample, I don't know, a hundred or something, if you're trying to kind of look at, you know, like what yeah. does what a typical document look like, right? Yeah, that's a really good idea too. I like that. Like in this yeah, the, case, for example. The other, I'm just, I'm just pulling out my, uh, my cheat sheets from our studio conference. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else has it. But when there's over plotting, there's another thing you can do that I can't remember, which is like opacity, the opacity. Yeah, um, tra or transparency. Yeah, but I can't yeah. remember what they call it in in the. Yeah, I think in in our in uh in uh ggplot, it's like the alpha. I think there's like an that's, alpha. That's the one. That's the one. I know yeah. Sam would know that, but I don't. Yeah, I have to look it up. See, thank you for bringing that. This is this is fantastic um, because some of these, you know, kind of it's hard to think about these cool things when you have so much other stuff like to deal with. So this is really this is really fun because um, you know you're giving you're giving us a lot of great ideas. Yeah, the other the other uh, thing I've seen with parallel coordinates sometimes is you could plot the um, the average of the lines. Right, so all that you could plot the like all these blue guys, you could plot the let me go here. You could plot the average of them, and then maybe have I don't know some sort of confidence band going around it. So you could sometimes plot that uh, here, which might help. All right, so Randall has a lot to lot to look at. Um, all right, this is the binary case, and we found eight groups here also. Notice that most of them, uh, we have a few, we have like two small ones, one like medium one, and the rest are kind of uh, similar sizes, right? So we don't have um, one really giant one, uh, a large one, and then a bunch of small ones. So this this seems a little kind of nicer to me, uh, but I have no reason to to justify that. But anyway, but look at this. I mean, visually, uh, this seems a little nicer to me. We don't have that weird um, comet-like configuration of points. It's a little more they're a little more spread out, I guess, or and so here's the 
Again, the colors correspond to the clusters and they don't look too bad. And then here we've just highlighting one of the uh, clusters. And so what we do, we would like to see them sort of having the same um, kind of trajectories and are they sort of close together. Okay, so what we just showed was uh, screenshots from the Shiny app. And this is for, this would be similar to if we had all the articles published at the same time and we just clustered them. Uh, so just things to note, it, the approach estimated eight clusters, regardless of whether, uh, how we encoded it. Uh, but really, and visually, you know, the, we didn't really see any red flags, I guess it looked reasonable, but can we get an idea of the topics? Um, and all right, here's where I have to turn my camera off because I have to peer closely. <laughs> uh, and I think this, one of the things we have to do is to take a look at this a little more carefully and um, try to see what we could tease out but just looking at these word clouds so this this is about um wages but look it's also about injuries and illnesses injuries illnesses and fatal injuries this is retail trade uh but also healthcare and employment um i like this one over here the weekly benefit the benefit amount but then also uh some here on indians these two on this lower left spot are interesting because this has to do with social security, defined benefit, and then here is about um, Gulf War era veterans, which I thought was um, kind of surprising. I was trying to think of, you know, the Gulf War and when that happened, but my sense of time is so skewed right now. Um, but I guess if we think this happened in the early 2000s, um, anyway, I have to go back and look and see when those happen. But if you remember, the, the major areas were employment, unemployment, prices, here's prices, um, working conditions, you know, salary benefits, illness, injuries. Um, and so we see that reflected here in these um, word clouds. Oh, and I should note that this, these were the clusters with the raw frequency encoded data. In the binary case, we see similar things here. Uh, price index, weekly benefit. Uh, I we didn't see minimum, yeah, minimum wage uh, is in both. Over here, we don't see the social security or the Gulf War era veterans, but instead we have this one here that says gross gains and losses. This is, I think, focusing on the monthly employment report, which talks about how many jobs are gained and how many jobs are lost in the month. Uh, all right. Oh, this one over here I thought was interesting because it has uh, a lot of stuff on demographics as well as uh, college graduates, bachelor's degrees, and so on. But then we have, uh, well, here's the Gulf War era. But Hispanics, black, white, um, race, ethnicity, and so on. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So what did we see? Uh, I like to see what do we see that's common, right? So what, what themes are common to both, you know, regardless of the encoding that we used, and we see it's uh, some of them were prices, minimum wage, weekly benefit. Because if if I see the same kind of theme or topic, regardless of the approach used, then to me, right or wrong, that means it's 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 kind of real, you know. And um, so that it's some um, structure that's really there, that it's not just noise that I'm finding. But I think what you find that's different is also important. And these are some of the things that were different that we found. 
between the two approaches. All right, so I said the Bayesian clustering approach developed by Terrence had two options. We already looked at one single source. The other one was sort of the hierarchical where we're going to take into account the fact that it's not one group of uh, articles published at the same time. It was, they were published over a 14 year span. So the next slides I'm going to show you um, aren't the Shiny app because the Shiny app doesn't exist yet. Uh, and I have to say that it does find global clusters, but we're going to also going to also look at what happens locally, meaning each year. So I don't have the bar charts for each of the um, uh, the clusters for each encoding. But instead, I've got uh, just a table. And so for the binary case, it found seven groups. And we see that there's two kind of large clusters. And um, but the rest were kind of reasonable size. Not, it's not with the case where we have like a really large one or, and then really small ones. So I think we saw this uh, before, if my memory's right, with the binary encoding. With the raw encoding, we have uh, two kind of large ones, and then we have some, some smaller ones, only 15 articles, 19 articles. So kind of similar to what we had before. All right, so this is the raw case where we found eight. Um, I kind of put here which ones were the large ones. So this one was a large cluster. This I think is on employment, unemployment. Healthcare was also a large cluster over here. So we see similar um, uh, topics, right? I have to go, I have to kind of list this because I don't remember whether the Gulf War was with the raw or not. I think it was. Um, but I have to go back and check, but we don't see social security here. Uh, yeah, we don't see it here either. So we don't see that um, with this approach. The binary case, we had seven clusters, uh, similar uh, to what we had before. So I don't know that this, although, um, Remember this, the gross gains, that was um, not found before with the raw uh, encoding. But now we see it in both cases. All right. So I can turn my camera back on because that's, I think, the end of the word clouds. I'm going to show you a plot that I really need some help with. Um, and uh, Sam told me uh, an idea, but I don't remember what, what she said. I have some idea of what we could do, um, but these plots need, need some work. Because what you're going to see is um, some bar charts. You'll see a little bar chart for each year, okay? So each panel is a year. And across the bottom, uh, so the bars correspond to the global clusters. So these you know, in this case, the seven clusters or the eight for the raw. Um, but then it shows you the distribution of the articles in that year corresponding to the global topic that was found or the global cluster. So one of the things we're looking for is, um, are the distributions of the topics kind of similar through the years? Um, do the topics or the do the global clusters appear in each year? And if that's the case, then it would indicate that there is some kind of dependence and that it would it does make sense to account for the fact that these articles were published um, each year. Okay, so I know you guys hate this, right? <laughs> uh, because it's really hard to see, I think. But anyway, at the bottom, so this is the raw case, and I think there's, oh yeah, this one was eight, right? Eight, eight groups. And let's see, in year 2000, 
uh, I think each of the topics are represented except maybe one. Uh, but you can kind of see that the distributions are somewhat similar. And for most of the years, each topic is represented. Of course, this plot really doesn't show you. Um, it'd be kind of nice to have the bars sort of labeled with, you know, um, themes from the word clouds. But and then we have the same thing for the binary case. Now, my one thought was that you could do this sort of like as a dot plot, you know, where you had. trying to visualize this but yeah I feel like you could sort of play around with just kind of like switching what's the x what's the y seeing if you have like a single panel and you're plotting against here or you're plotting against you know like maybe each cluster is a different color or each year is a different color sort of see you know what what makes sense yeah because I, I was thinking you could either kind of group it by by year right and then have a dot plot so you could have the year sorry i wish i had a pen here did year 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 going this way and then um how many of each topic with the bars going to the, or you know the dots going to the right um so you could either kind of group it by year or by topic right so you could have Global topic one, how many years does it fit in? I don't know if that would be too informative. But the other thing I thought Randall and I were talking about was um, going back to the parallel coordinates that you could put uh, one of the axes maybe as the year. What do you think about that? That sounds fine. Yeah. Um, with the with the other plot, um, the faceting plot, I was you can there's a way that you can so it looks like that one was done in base R. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. But there's a way that you can do it where in if you if you can figure out how to do it in if you can do it in tidyverse, then then there's a way that you can tell it so that it it can do it on top of each other so that you're not looking at all of them you know it, it, it you can have like so let's see how many you I think how many do you have there 14 so you could do seven on top and seven on bottom and I think that would be easier to look at um the the best yeah, and, go ahead Samina that's right. I didn't, I didn't want to interrupt. So I was gonna say, like, I think one one benefit if you do it in ggplot or tidyverse, you can you can try out different things quickly, right? Because it's all sort of in your data frame, and then you can see, okay, what if the color is this thing? What if I'm faceting by this variable? What if I'm faceting by that variable? And then you can kind of see what would you know if there's one that seems to you know be more insightful <laughs> than the others. Yeah, I like that. And then the other thing I was thinking is looking at one of the scatter plots like this. Could you could we have where would it make sense to have like um, you could select so kind of like how this is grayed out where you could s select the cluster ID, but could you select the year. So in other words, just show the the dots for the year. And then the rest are grayed out. I, th I think that's a good idea. Um, so I, I mean, they, visualizing multi-dimensional data is is really, really, you know, is really challenging. But I think, um, yeah, I do think you could do that. I was just going to mention that um, I think the best way to, if you know base R and, and you're wanting to learn, you know, ggplot too. Or in tidyverse, the best way to do that is to watch David Robinson's videos on Twitter. He does Tidy Tuesday and he does it every week. And you know, he's he's like amazing. He's was a very early adapter in tidyverse, and so he has a, you know very skilled at that. So anyway, what's what's his last name? 
Oh, he, you said he was the Tidy Tuesday, so I can find it. Yeah. It's David Robinson, R O B I N S O N. Yeah. I'm taking notes. Gosh. Well, because I'm a base R person too. And so I'm, you know, I'm also, I'm also, I also am, uh, you know, it's changed so much since I learned it too. So, but anyway. Yeah, I, I tend to, I have not done much at all in ggplot too. Um, yeah, I, I guess just my problem is that I'm not a real consistent R user. So I have to go back and relearn. and you know, when you have to go back and relearn something that's a little more complicated, like ggplot. <laughs> you know, it's, although I suppose once you have it and you've kind of learned it, then it's not so bad. But um, the, th the thing is, is that they're always changing it anyway. So if you do learn it, then it just, you know, six months later, it's different. So, so you know, it's, it's a muscle that you have to keep exercising, you know? Yeah. I've, talked, I've talked to our people at our studio about it and they say, well, you get a bunch of software engineers together and they're going to make software. So of course it keeps changing. So um, just yeah. so you know. <laughs> Okay, so I don't, I don't, you're making me feel better because, um, yeah, I keep thinking about that, you know, there's so much stuff to, to learn. And one of the things I want to do, I keep telling poor Randall, is that I want to write a shiny app. I mean, I know I can write a shiny app, but I just have to do it. And, um, but I just can't seem to, to do it. <laughs> uh, one of these days, I will write one. Uh, so, as I said, this is like really, really preliminary work. Um, we've already talked about uh, better graphics. I could do different encoding. Uh, there's something, so the, the bag of words doesn't account for word order. There's another type of um, approach that's called the bigram proximity matrix that I could use, which does account for word pairs. Um, I do like to apply model-based clustering. Uh, it also provides an estimate of the number of groups. Um, so uh, I'd like to try that. Sam did um, topic modeling. I've never had much success with topic modeling. Um, I'm sorry, this is Monica. That was, that, that was one of the main questions I had. Was there, was there a reason why you didn't go with topic models? Was there some sort of disadvantage? To um, probably that you know, I, I tend to use kind of the tools that I usually use, but also S Sam did the topic modeling and I've just not had success with, I mean, I've not actually tried it. I've not like, kind of done the work myself, but whenever I've seen the results of topic modeling, I just, I sort of don't get it. And it's hard for me to really understand what are the, are the results. Um, but yeah, that I mean, that's definitely something uh, to look more at. And I need to go back and see what Sam did and what her results were. Um, have you done much topic modeling? I I I have. I, I mean, not a lot, but some. But but yes, that that is the the problem that that I keep running into. You know, what does what does this all mean? And and. <laughs> And, and some of the work that, I, that I'm doing is actually with comment letters and, you know, the, the, the big, the big enigma is, will it be applicable to the next batch? Um, so. True. Yeah. And that's one of the problems, that's one of the real difficulties with um, doing uh, clustering doc. Well, it's just working with documents anyway, because it's hard to assign meaning to something because I could read a document and give it a topic label and somebody else could give it a, to a totally different topic label because we kind of interpret meaning different ways, right? So it's, it's not like absolute. So it's really hard to, um, and even looking at the word clouds I showed, you know, you'd almost have to really you know, stare at it and try to figure out what's going on. And, I'm not an economist, right? So what I need to do is go back and you know, kind of tease out what I can and then go to the economist and say, does this make sense uh, as um, 
some labels. The other thing I've I always want to do and I never really do is to take some of those larger groups and and kind of think of them as a separate little corpus and then cluster them and see well maybe this one big cluster or group is made up of like other little mini topics because some of them aren't real clear you know uh what they're about the other kind of wacky idea i had was this one because if we're trying to develop a classification system the idea that would be all right i want to be able to classify future documents so could we once we get sort of a good clustering whatever it is once we get that could we take the cluster ids consider them to be like class labels you know, class one class two class three or whatever and then take some of the articles from other years that i haven't looked at and then classify them do supervised learning and classify them with one of these groups that i found uh and then see if that makes any sense i don't know if that would really tell us anything <laughs> uh, but it was just a thought i had and um, then finally of course we need to to finish the apps and integrate them into the package and actually publish the package which as i said we haven't done yet so uh here is my contact information oh wow i went past 8 30 i'm sorry <laughs> it was it was fine it was very interesting wendy we, <laughs> we were enjoying your talk so Right. Well, yeah, nobody gave me the hook or anything, so I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's totally fine. It's totally fine. Um, I guess I guess we should go. Does anyone have any questions or anything that they want to talk about um, right now? Since we're since we're here, you're welcome to unmute yourself. Um, I guess I'll quit sharing. There we go. And um, do you want me to send you the slides? Gwen? Sure, you can send me the slides. Um, yeah, you have my email address, don't you? Yeah, I think you do. I, th I think I do. If not, I, I can send them to Sam, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I have your address. Yeah. If not, I'll get it from Mike. <laughs> Mike you do. Yeah, Mike has my address, so yeah. So uh, I think, well, thanks for letting me blather on for so long. I think um, I don't think I don't. It doesn't look like there's any questions from anyone. So um, or at least no questions they want recorded. So I'm going to stop the <laughs> recording and see if That's anyone and see if anyone else pops out.